So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'd like to welcome everyone to the CCIDM expert speaker series. Today, we have a special person as a guest speaker. Carlos Garcia is no stranger to the Cal Poly Pomona community. He's our friend and supporter of our program. I first met him in 2013, eight years ago, at the SoCal Educational Day event of the Insights Association. Since then, he came to our campus many times, uh, sometimes as guest speaker to AMI Club, a participant to market research certificate program development efforts later, and a professor to marketing research class a few years ago. He's also a father of a graduate of our master's program, environmental design program. Um, I have enjoyed all the interactions with him and appreciate all the involvement he has had with our program. For the industry, insights and data industry, he is one of the thought leaders as such he has been often sought out for speech and leadership positions and has received numerous awards and recognitions. I'm very pleased and honored to be able to invite him as a, our expert speaker. With 40 years of experience in the industry, there's no person than he that fits better with today's topic, evolution in the market research industry, looking to the future by examining the past. Without further ado, here is Carlos. Please join me welcoming him warmly. Thank you, everyone. Oops. Uh, yes, continue. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Yes. Do you see it? Does everyone see the screen? Yeah, we can see it. Yes. OK, thanks. Great. Okay, so here we go. Uh, the evolution of the market research industry. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on myself first. Let me see. How do I do? Change pages here. Uh, oh, I see. There it is. Okay. Okay. So here's a little background about myself. Um, born in East LA. Both my parents were born in Mexico. Uh, grew up in a bilingual household, um, which I totally took for granted, and I didn't really pay much attention to as much attention as I could, should have to, this, to my Spanish. So anybody who comes from a multilingual uh, household, really don't take that for granted. That is a really incredible asset for you, incredibly important uh, moving through your life um, and um, for yourself, for your profession, uh, and also for your children. Um, so pay attention to that. Um, went to parochial grammar schools, uh, went to Loyola High School, went to Jesuit College Prep, school, which was um, uh, academically well, good, uh, socially was horrifying <laughs> for a, um, a small, poor, gay student, um, Latino at that. Um, so I was very lucky to get into Pomona College, uh, where I was a foreign languages major, graduated cum laude, I was a graduation speaker, I was kind of a fairly visible person on campus, and I've stayed very much involved with Pomona College, I've, I've been past president of the Alumni Association, um, so I would re also recommend that when, you know, stay in touch with your classmates uh, when you can, really plan on that and stay in touch with uh, your school. Um, staying involved with, you know, uh, continue education programs and, and, and prof professors give lectures. Go to those, attend those, listen, zoom in on them. Um, they're really incredibly valuable and that is something else that will contribute to your life throughout your life. You have Cal Poly as your, as your alma mater. Keep it as your mater, I mean, really, and your pater too. Uh, but it's really important to stay in touch with your college um, and your classmates. Uh, I have a master's from UC Berkeley in comparative literature, which is like an advanced degree in 16th century shepherd songs. Actually, I did 16th century theater, theatrical literature. Uh, and I loved it, and I learned how to write there. And, you know, there are a lot of skills that you pick up along the way that don't seem directly related to your career, but will be, um, particularly things like writing. Uh, which a lot of people take for granted and don't pay enough attention to, but it's a super important part of your career, a part of your life. Um, 
And I had a Ford Foundation Fellowship for that. And I studied the Sorbonne with, under the Ford Foundation Fellowship. Lived in France for four years. My son was born there. Um, and I still love to go to France as often as I can. I was there in 2019, just before the, the pandemic and had a wonderful, wonderful experience uh, seeing parts of France I'd never seen before. Um, and there's a lot to see. So, um, you know, connected to, being connected to uh, travel abroad, gets in it when, when the world opens up again, go. Um, because it's a great big world out there. It's a fascinating place to live, to be in, uh, to experience. If you just stay in America, and you keep these blinders on, you, you just don't see the rest of the world. You really have to get out, out, of the, out of your little shell, out of your comfort zone and go explore the rest of the world. Whenever my students talk to me about opportunities they had to do study abroad, I said, go, go, anywhere, 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 go. Um, so I've got, also got a master's degree at National University, um, which I was a graduation speaker, but it was basically a school for working adults. It wasn't quite as, as, you know, as rigorous as your uh, Cal Poly program, um, but it was uh, useful for somebody who was working and had kids and a job and, you know, all, and, and uh, a house that was a fixer and all these other things. But it was, a very, it, was, it was very convenient for me. So I worked in research for, starting in San Diego for 10 years um, before I finally started my own company, Garcia Research Associates. After 20 years, after being whacked by the Great Recession, um, badly, uh, <clears throat> we merged with a company called Knowledge Networks, which was the founders of the Knowledge Panel, which you might read about in the, in the press from time to time, um, because they, the Knowledge Panel is still very much alive, but it's now owned by Ipsos. But um, so I, I was hired by, uh, part, became part of Knowledge Networks. I was a senior vice president for Multicultural, which was really a great experience. And then I went to, they were acquired by a big global company, GFK, which is a very different experience, um, but and not nearly as fun, interesting uh, and different, um, but then, then I still have very, very fond memories of my Knowledge Networks experience. Everyone was so smart and so, so clever <clears throat> and so dedicated to their work. Um, I did teach at Cal Poly for two semesters. Um, basically couldn't stand the, the 90, 90 mile commute each way. <laughs> and then of course, right after I quit, then the pandemic happened and everything went online and it would have been much easier, but too late. Um, I've won various awards as uh, Jim mentioned, including an award for contributions to market, the marketing research industry. And that made something that made me very proud because I've been fighting my entire professional life to promote multicultural research. Um, and I'm still doing that. Um, I'm on the, right now I'm on the, the Insights Association's Idea Council, uh, which is a group of about 20 people uh, promoting multiculturalism uh, and uh, IDEA stands for um, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. So these are, you know, really important issues uh, all around, around everything that, that our industry faces uh, because our industry has been less than fully representative of the population it studies and it hasn't even been studying the, the right populations the right way, but I'll talk about that later. So uh, after a whole bunch of other things, I'm now back running Garcia Research mostly for our operations center in Tijuana, Mexico. And we do, uh, we have a call center and operations center, we do programming, que uh, questionnaire programming, uh, uh, caddy programming uh, and um, data processing and report, report writing and stuff like that. So I'm a father and a grandfather married for 22 years to a wonderful man. Yesterday was our 22nd anniversary. We had a lovely dinner out last night. So what was research? Research is really in full on evolution as we speak. But it's still a 70, you know, almost a 74 billion dollar, um, you know, quarter of a trillion dollars, I mean, 75 billion, 75 billion dollar, not quarter of a billion, uh, trillion, but anyway, 75 billion dollar industry. It's incredibly big and incredibly in, in full of evolution. Uh, it was effectively invented by Daniel Starch in 1920 to try to track radio advertising. Was it every radio advertising working? Who was reaching, reaching? How could they make it more effective? So it kind of followed on the medium. You know, the, the media push caused research to push because they needed to know if, the, if, if each of the, these, uh, each medium was actually working. So Procter & Gamble is one of the first companies to adopt this technique and to apply it to their product development and, 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 and all of their advertising. You know, they also invented the soap opera. The so it's called the soap opera because it was P&G. They were selling soap, um, literally. Um, but the, you know, one of the great stories about P&G was this cake, the cake mix study. It's a classic case study, uh, which, because they introduced a, a, just a, a, a cake mix. All you have to do is add, add water. And it was a complete failure. Um, but it was a hit when you had to add fresh egg and a cup of milk. 
then, then the housewife felt like she was adding something. But now that women are no longer just housewives, they have lives and they have jobs and they have responsibilities. I, I really don't think that that case study would really work anymore. I don't think it would apply because you know, people's lives are so complicated and men are just as likely to do it and may not have the same you know, perceived emotional attachment to you know, milk and eggs. And it's not always easy to find milk and eggs. So maybe you, know, you would have to rethink all these old studies and all these old truisms because situations change, lives change, uh, uh, dynamics change. Qualitative research was invented when people realized they couldn't explain quantitative segmentation data. It actually followed on a quant, on a quant study. And this quant study in particular was, I actually went to a QRCA, uh, Qualitative Research Consultants Association event in New York. And the gentleman who basically in, invented the focus group uh, spoke at it, it was Professor Johnson from Columbia, really interesting guy. And he talked about how they were trying to understand political data that they were getting. And they were finding people who were pro-life, but also pro-death penalty. And people who were against uh, pro-choice and against the death penalty. Like, okay, we need to try to understand this. What's driving this? What's the underlying issue here? So they basically discovered that it's basically um, the, the, the pro-lifers and pro-death penalty basically see life in terms of uh, black and white, innocent and guilty. Um, it was a guilt and innocence versus innocence thing. Uh, and that's how they, they were seeing the world. And that's how they were would, you know, rationalizing their positions that seem, are seemingly contradictory. Whereas the, the people who are pro-choice and, and, and against the death penalty were all shades of gray. You don't know what the situation is. It's all situation, you know, what, what is the circumstances? How did they get in the situation? What happened? You, how do you know? You know, it was just much more, 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 more complex uh, uh, a, a thinking process. And so understanding how people were, under, were relating to issues was really important to understanding them and really important to drive messaging, try to understand what, what these people were, were like um, so, uh, but the, in general, throughout the history of this industry, it's always focused on the lowest hanging fruit. People were easiest to get, the, the obvious questions, the same old sampling structures. And uh, even through most of my career, people really focused on trend versus relevance. They were doing ongoing tracking studies. They, they had uh, measures against which they met. They based their advertising decisions, how much money they put in this, on this network or that network or this, this medium versus that medium. Um, and they really focused on trend versus relevance. So even as the populations were evolving, they weren't um, because they wanted everything the same. They wanted to be studying the exact same thing. And it often led to companies being irrelevant because they were no longer you know, responding to what was really going on in the population. So here's the evolution of an industry. And this is the core slide of what I want to talk to you about because the industry has changed so much over the years. I've been doing this for 40 years. And it's been one paradigm shift after another paradigm shift after another paradigm shift. And frankly, you can expect more um, because things keep changing. Uh, when I first started in the industry, everything was based on door-to-door. Door-to-door -door. Door -door research was considered the gold standard. That meant having tr census tracts, drawing random census tracts around the country, um, and then sending people to knock at every nth door, uh, and then doing interviews in person with a clipboard. Uh, and um, and that's how it was done. Um, and, uh, and then at one point people said, oh, that's too unreliable. You know, we stopped doing that when one of our, our interviewers got, nearly got killed in a, in a drive-by shooting. Um, and we realized that, you know, they walk around dangerous neighborhoods with loads, you know, $5, $5, wads of $5 to give out this incentives to the respondents. And they realized this was just too dangerous. And then you, you couldn't get into a lot of buildings or a lot of the, uh, places because of home security. So basically the door-to-door -door, um, business went away. Um, and then it became all about central location phone. And central location phone is still used. You'll see a lot of the uh, polling data is done this way. Um, but uh, then, you know, when, R, when RDD came out, oh my God, random digit dialing. So you just, you pick a, a, an area code, you do random digits on the area code, you pick your area codes randomly. And it was all very randomness upon randomness. It was all very lovely, but it was all dependent on people picking up the phone and talking to you for 15, 20 minutes. It's like, can you imagine? <laughs> but they did. Um, and it was, they didn't get any incentive. They were just doing this out of the kindness of their heart. Um, you know, talking, you know, filling in people on, on some, some study of, or another. And you can imagine why, you know, political studies or 
certain types of, of very personal things, people might really be invested in it. <clears throat> but otherwise, um, they would also um, uh, not, uh, uh, but there were also toothpaste studies and you know, canned soup studies and things that were just you know, simple business issues. And you basically would talk to people who were bored uh, or, or had time. So the samples tended to be skew older uh, and female. And it became really the hardest to find with the young males. And, uh, and it was always just, it was just this really difficult process. And then we started a random, random household selector. We would talk to people, uh, select, get a, get a census of each home and then talk, find out who was there uh, of, of everybody in the home and then randomly select that, one, that person to talk to. And of course, if you didn't, then you try to make appointments. It was very length, lengthy, very complex process. But it was all people were worried about randomness and about really getting a, a good sample. And then everything went online. Everything went online. Everything went online. So uh, it was really um, very. Um, let me see if I can move this up here. There we go. Um, it was all about doing it on online. And certainly, oops, I changed that. Sorry. Online is still obviously very important. Ah. Uh, online is still obviously very important, um, but things are changing now. Again, um, online panels um, tend to skew female. They tend to skew uh, white. Um, they there are certain. They tend to skew upper, better educated. Um, so there's a lot of different different and this uh, slightly higher income, not super high income, but you know middle income. So there's a lot of, of skews to these online panels, especially those that are. Um, that are completely opt-in, uh, opt-in panels versus invite-in. The knowledge panel that I mentioned, I referred to earlier, is like the also um, NORC, which is run out of the University of Chicago, has a, um, a, a panel called the Amerispeak panel, uh, and they do a lot of really interesting stuff. They're also an invite-in panel along along with the national, but along with the knowledge networks, uh, network uh, knowledge panel, rather. Excuse me. So knowledge panel and Amerispeak are two invite in panels and they're very nationally representative and they recruit for uh, a full representation of the United States. Uh, and it's really great exercises, great projects. Uh, and I've worked, had, had the honor of working on both and I still work on the knowledge panel. Um, so that's something that's really exciting to me uh, because it is a really completely representative sample. So when anybody wants to do a study that's gonna be up for peer review of, you know, for a peer reviewed journal, uh, or if they want to publish something, uh, uh, or they need to present something to Congress, to a committee of Congress, they, they need an unassailable data source. So rather than relying on, on online panels that, that are opt in, and then they have to do a lot of waiting and stratification and, you know, wait, 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 you know, to try to get it balanced, um, they use these, these uh, much more reliable, um, but more, much more expensive um, uh, invite in panels. But now uh, what's, uh, that's still there, but, uh, but now more and more people are using their smartphone for everything. The, the, this, your smartphone is your world, it's your life, it's, your, it's also your, your uh, my granddaughters. Um, and it's more um, uh, based on um, your life with the way people live now. And people live with their phones, everything's on your phone. And then one thing I was always complaining to my, my students at Cal Poly is like, they, you know, they would see a word they didn't know or they would not respond to it uh, or they'd use a word incorrectly. I said, you know, the whole world, every all human knowledge is basically right here in the palm of your hand. Look things up. It's all there. Everything's here. But also because the smartphone is so important to people's lives, they always have them with them. Smartphones are being more and more, more, and more often used for research. You can do global, you could do a geofencing, you know where somebody is, you know what department of what of, of the target they're in. Um, you know, I, I was lined to sign up for a, one of these uh, these panels, uh, and I walked into the shoe department of, of Target, and Bing, I got a, a big re a request for a study about the sh the, the, the the shoe department at, at Target. Not that I bought shoes at Target, but I have to be walking through there. Um, so anyway, so everything is much more in the moment, it's more experiential. A lot of things are changing, uh, and um, it, you know, and and people think, oh, well, this is it. This is how it's going to be. Well. You don't know. People are changing, and they will always change. So um, the the whole industry used to be run by more focused on research professionals, like my old career, where you know we, we, a vendor 
a supplier rather than the supplier side would get a request from a, from a client side and we would have a study to, to run a study and we would do the study. We did, you know, get the, get the issues, write a questionnaire, collect the data, write the report and present the report. And uh, the client would have that. But now research is much faster, much quicker and much more of a DIY system. Uh, there are tons of different panels, uh, platforms rather, that offer online options for questionnaire structures, sample access, all sorts of advanced analytical packages. You can do, you can do a conjoint, you can do a max diff, you can do you know, landscaping, um, you know, a, a market landscape. Um, you can all do all of those things and they have built-in qualitative options and uh, really interesting reporting structures, which are nobody, who has time to read a report? We used to issue, issue these reports that were like 125, 150 50 pages long. And nobody, read, nobody ever reads them. Uh, at one point, my, my old boss wrote a, wrote a note uh, in one of the reports say, uh, like 100, page 135 of her report, she wrote, um, and if anybody comes across and actually reads this, call me and I'll send you a five, check for $5, $10. No one ever called. <laughs> No one ever got that money because she, she, nobody ever read it. So, uh, so now dashboards are the thing and dashboards are what? They're quick, they're immediate, they're boom, it's all here. Uh, so much about research now is about data visualization. So when you do data, your data visualization right, you have a much better chance of impacting the, the decision makers presenting the data in the most powerful, useful, practical light you can possibly imagine. So, um, so obviously, you know, young people are really, really adept to learning the new platforms and it's, it's harder for people of my generation. Um, but if you don't do it, you have to. I mean, you just have to. You have to learn all these things. So, um, so I have um, uh, digital native spies. I have my colleagues who, and, and employees who, do, who look things up and explain them to me. So um, I, I, that's really pretty important. So um, one thing you'll find is with mentors when you have a mentor in, the, in the, your life, you can contribute a lot to your mentor as well. And that used to not always be the case. You used to come in and be re, 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 totally depend on your mentor to teach you everything. Well, now you can teach your mentors a lot because you are digital natives, you are you know, millennials and, and, and Gen Zers. Um, so you know a lot about what's going on that they don't know. They don't know. So you have a lot to contribute. So don't underestimate your own power. So, you know, studies used to take six months, uh, three to six months. I mean, it was just amazing how much time we had to, to do these studies. And now nobody has that time anymore. Decisions are made so quickly uh, and some large complex projects still need the time, things that you're gonna hang your hat on for a while, um, but, you know, like a real deep, deep dive segmentation study or something like that. But most are really super quick because some solutions are out there that you can get, you have a question you send to, to a supplier on, uh, on, on Monday and you get a report on Thursday. And then you can, boom, you can go with, go with it. Um, because one of the reasons why this longer, the shorter studies are important is you can see in your own lives how things can turn on a dime. You know, in February of 2020, everything was fine. In March, ah, you know, everything's, ah, everything's crazy and nuts. And so, you know, things, things change. There can be, you know, uh, weather conditions or political conditions or um, uh, natural disasters or a pandemic, so many things, or economic uh, disruption, so many things can change so quickly um, that, you know, you as researchers have to be on it and quick and ready to, you know, go with it. Um, so, um, and also what's happening in the industry, what used to be intensely humanistic is becoming more technologically focused. AI, you hear about it all the time, you read about it all the time. People are using AI to analyze open ends. They're using AI to analyze focus groups. Um, even a full on, you know, two hour long focus groups, AI will break it all down, look at what was going on and, you know, do all these different things. There are also these technologies that do facial recognition and, and eye tracking and um, all of these things. And there are, there are very powerful tools and it's useful to know them. Um, but um, it is, the industry is changing that way. The industry is changing because the consumer is changing. There's really no other reason. It's not, you know, the te yeah, the technology is allowing us to do more new, new and exciting things, but it's really because, the, and the, the technology is trying to keep up with the consumer. Uh, sometimes the technology seems to lead the consumer uh, to the extent that like, you know, Steve Jobs invented this. Um, and um, 
in the event of the, 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 the smartphone and how that has changed our lives. So technology can lead, but more often it's following. But it's really interesting to see which, which is which. Um, but obviously people are, have much more, uh, less time in their lives. They have two income households, more responsibilities. And all of this last year with all the kids being at home, uh, driving everybody crazy. People are worried about their personal security. Uh, people, you know, people are, are de demands on privacy are really, really a big deal. There's the CCPA and the, the, uh, the European version of that, GD GDPR. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Anyway, um, the media landscape is completely changing also. I mean, we used to have four, eight, 12 networks. And then, uh, and then there was, they became, you know, the, 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 all of the, the cable. And then there were the cable standards, you know, ESPN and TNS and TBS and uh, whatever, all, the, all the, the standard cable channels. And now that's all exploded as well. And now everything's streaming. Um, and, um, and people are using their phones for, for, you know, for following television shows or sports events or things. So, um, so the media landscape is completely changing and it will continue to evolve. Um, and so, you know, a lot of what the research is doing is changing, chasing that. It's really been interesting to see how companies like Nielsen are, are trying to incorporate all these different data sources and how they're scrambling over backwards to do, the, do that because they have to. Um, the other thing is about people's attention spans. Partly because of the phone, people's attention spans are now down to three seconds. Three seconds. Goldfish get seven, seven seconds. Humans get three. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, oh, we now admire goldfish. Um, but seriously, uh, people's if you don't grab people's attention really quickly, boom, you lose them. If you have, you have to absolutely grab their attention. You have to really be clear what you're doing. You have to have some sort of understanding with them that they, you know, why you're asking them questions or ask them very super short questions, et cetera. You have to be so fast, so clear, uh, and so quick. So, um, you know, again, I say, saying here what I said before: external factors can change everything, and that can happen really quickly. Uh, and you have to be ready. Um, and every, you know, everybody, for example, expected with the, with the pandemic and all, and all of the. The, 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 the economic disruption that that caused as well, that the real estate industry would just collapse. It did the opposite. Who expected that? So sometimes you, you think, oh, well, if this happens, then that's gonna happen. Well, that happened in 20, 2008, but that didn't happen in 2020. It's, in fact, it was uh, kind of the opposite. So you know, every, every rule of economics, as far as I can tell, you know, is set for a specific period of time and everything change, as everything changes, then they write new rules. So that's why economists always have jobs because they keep rewriting the rules. Um, so, um, and, and on now people really do expect rewards for everything they do and they want substantial rewards. They want immediate rewards. That's why all of these, you know, reward systems for panels uh, have, are, many of them are based on points but some are just based on instant gratification instantly you know, gaining dollars or values or $22.50 or $5, whatever it is. Um, people do expect rewards for everything they do. They're very, very busy and you have to you know, grab them. And also, you know, we have so many distractions. We have so many things going on. Um, and um, so that's you know, why we, it's so hard these days to do research. Uh, and then things keep changing in interesting ways. Uh, new issues of demographics, you know, the gender question. It used to be so, are you male or female? It used to be so simple. Well, now it's not so simple. It's a much more complicated question. Are you, are you, you know, we were just had a meeting on our idea council and working with the MRS, the Market, Market Research uh, Society in, in England about gender questions because it's so, become so much more subtle and so much more complicated. Um, and people my age generally tend to hate those questions. The, the revised questions, they think it's, they see everything in terms of male, female, but you know, younger people don't. And so if you're trying to write a questionnaire for, for multiple generations, you have to reflect the reality that these people face, whether the old parts like it or not, you know, here come non-binary, here come queer, here come transgender, male to female, transgender, female to male, uh, questioning, not, not, not sure, whatever, whatever you are, whatever you, however you see your world, yourself in your world, we have to respect that because that is how you see the, you see yourself. Um, and um, so obviously, the, you know, the, 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 the whole racial ethnic descriptions are changing. Um, you know, it used to be really rude at one point in my life to, to call a person black. 
and the, the, the word of choice was Negro. And then, the, then, the, then it became the other way around. And then black became out of, fell out of favor. And then it was African-American for a while. And now it's black again. Um, and so, you know, it, the point isn't what the term is. The point is what people think of themselves, how they define themselves. And you have to be reflective of that. You have to be respectful of that. So it's not, not up to the researcher to tell people how to define themselves. It's up to the researcher to find out how people define themselves and to respond to that and ask the right questions the right way so that we can better understand them. Because it's not about us, it's about them. It's about the consumer. And also, obviously, um, you know, the whole uh, demographic thing is really causing major changes. Um, a couple of years ago, I went to a, a, an, MR, a, an inside association event, a regional event in, um, in, uh, in Las Vegas. And um, they had a futurist talking. And the futurist went on and on and on and on for a little 45 minute presentation. And she never once mentioned demographics. She never once mentioned multicultural communities. Not once, it's like, hello. Uh, and so I raised my hand and then I asked her that, that how about the, the, the demographic changes? How about the fact that in, you know, by, by, by 2040, the, the, you know, this will be a majority multicultural country. And she said, oh, well, she sort of skirted the issue, but everybody, all the other people of color in the group were saying, yeah, yeah, what about that? What about us? So, you know, this is, you have to respect what's going on in the world. Let me see, okay. So uh, the, another big interesting thing that's happening in the industry is integration of qual and quant. These used to be separate worlds and now they're really much more complicated, but I think qualitative research is essentially as old as, 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 the, as humans. We've always been trying to feel each other out ask questions, what do you think? Um, people do that obviously in, inside a relationship or inside a household, but also with your neighbors, with, your, with the people you meet, wherever you go. So you're always evaluating people, you're looking at their body language, you're looking at their eyes, their eyes, are they, they, they squinting, are they angry? They look, they look angry, they look happy, uh, they look sad. What, you know, you're always evaluating things. The qualitative research has always been important in our daily lives, because it just is. But now there are people are working with qual, in much more hand in hand with quant. Because without, with, with knowing what is going on, without understanding why it's going on, doesn't really help you that much. You can hypothesize what, why, it's, why this is happening, but then you have to do another study. So people are, are and they don't have time to do another study. So people are more and more integrating qual and quant uh, in interesting ways, and, and the platforms allow this. Um, so, uh, and AI uses all, a lot of the you know, facial recognition, verbal open ends, uh, and this, this also really helps uh, provide the whys for a quant study. So, um, and the key thing is, you know, again, I say that people want to know not the what, but also the why. Um, and they, you know, they, they can do this through social media monitoring, heat maps, looking at how things, how things are evolving and what people are talking about and all that thing, can be, all that can be done. Uh, and it's all really very, very interesting. Where am I? Okay. Multiculturalism. So obviously, um, you know, our industry has always been um, uh, dominated by, by the, you know, the Caucasians. Um, and uh, it was always an industry that had a lot of women in it. Uh, so gender issues were never as big an issue uh, in our industry, but the multicultural issues are. So um, all these you know, marginalized communities were really not in most companies' radar. And it really didn't change until the millennium dawned really. Um, and then people started realizing, well, they had to. You know, when I started in my in research, my the Hispanic market was 5% of the total US population. Uh, and now it's more like almost, almost 19%. So, uh, and then when you add that to the African American, Asian American, and all, and all, all the other groups, um, you know, we're getting close to 40%. Um, and you cannot, <laughs> how can you ignore 40%? Um, it's, it's, it's just impossible. So, um, but really, honestly, I credit the millennials and Gen Z for, for this change, for the sea change, because people aren't putting up with that stuff anymore. That you don't demand it, you expect it. It's just expected. If you see a, you know, a, an ad campaign where everybody is white all the time, it's like, where am I? I'm not there. Well, it's also just weird because that's not the world you live in. Even if you are white and you see nothing but white people, it's like, where do they live? You know, it's like, it's not my world. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so obviously, um, uh, this is really a, a big sea change in the industry, and that's something the Idea Council is really working on hard uh, to try to bring to our, our whole industry, uh, including th there's two tracks to that. One is the professional side, hiring, promotions, uh, et cetera. 
So this, that, we, that we have a, a, a population, I mean, the staff, uh, professionals in our industry who understand these different communities because they are part of these different communities and they were raised with or around these different communities. So it doesn't like you have to be white to understand, you know, you have, can't have to be black to understand a black person. It means you have to know and understand and appreciate or experience black, black lives and black friends and black uh, partners and, 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 um, and, and colleagues to, to, you know, to, to understand where they are, where they're coming from. The, the California is a harbinger of all things future and always has been and still is, I believe, because we're California is about two thirds multicultural. So, um, and we will be a majority by 2040 or so. Um, but this is complications because it's tricky to do. Multicultural research is tricky to do. It's not easy to do. It takes up more time and it's more expensive. And even then a lot of the multicultural work that gets done doesn't necessarily do a good job of reaching, you know, the people who, um, are you know inner city uh, poor? Um, they they do a very not a good job of reaching people who speak uh, languages other than Spanish, um, and obviously they do often don't do a particularly good job of reaching people who speak Spanish either. Um, but generally, the Hispanic population is the largest uh, non English speaking population. But you know if if you're not doing a study in Korean and Chinese, and um, uh, you're you're missing out on on a population that's really interesting and important. Um, so it is, it is tricky and it's hard, it's hard to do it right, but it must be done. So obviously, um, you know, you have to stay in your toes. The industry is changing. Um, you know, I talked to the, the, the three second tension span. Um, people want ad quick answers. Um, the most questions are no longer, most obvious questions are no longer obvious. Um, and how, you know, the, the life pre-COVID might not come back. New media keeps emerging. Cord cutting is the norm. Streaming is king. Um, and how we meet might very well stay the same. You know, we may be, you know, the Zoom world uh, may hang on there after, after COVID is, is over. Um, we as researchers are always just trying to keep track of what's going on. What are people thinking? What are they feeling? Um, and technology obviously is disrupting everything. I mean, you can read every journal, everything, everything comes out about market research. You can just track the industry. Uh, there are so many really interesting new things happening uh, in, um, in, uh, in our industry, but um, it's not always, to me, not always the most meaningful because a lot of things change, but a lot of things don't change. And this is, I just have a few minutes for this, but um, basically the basic rules of social science don't change. Demography, anthropology, sociology, psychology, and public health. These are basic things and they don't change. Statistics will not change. It's, kind of mathematical common sense, but the rules of statistics still apply and they will still apply. Um, sampling, you know, quality, quality sampling is really the key to all good research. Um, people will always have their own internal biases. Every study you do, if I wanted to find out how somebody saw a study, a, an issue or a category, I would ask them to write a questionnaire about it because the questions they ask and the answer grid op options they list will reveal their understanding. So whenever you write a study, you're basically writing it for yourself. So you always have to test yourself against other people, other people's experiences, other people's lives and, and views on things. I mean, like if I was doing a study on peanut butter, I hate peanut butter. So of course I'm gonna write a bunch of negative questions about peanut butter because I hate peanut butter. <laughs> I know everybody likes it except me. So, um, and obviously there are always inequalities in every, in every culture, every society. So, you know, overcoming those and reach, still reaching people who are, who are on the, on the downside of that in, those inequalities are, is difficult, but it's important. They're there, they're human beings. They buy things, they live things, you know, they, they share our world, they share our country. Um, so you have to respect them. And you know, if you don't respect the people you're studying, why are you doing this? Why are you doing anything? You also have to know the history of what people have experienced and what it's been like. If you know, you're worried about African-Americans and under being, uh, being uh, concerned about um, uh, vaccines and, and, and being hesitant, have vaccine hesitancy, if you don't know the story, the history of all the ways that the medical industries of throughout, the, the, throughout the country, the, the centuries or decades at least, um, have treated African-Americans, you, know, you wouldn't understand why they are reluctant. But you have to understand the history to be able to really understand the, the present. So, um, so I just quick to them, thoughts. Everything's always changing. Uh, you have to adapt or die. Yes, technology make a huge difference. Use them, but you know, technology will never overcome 
humanity. You still have to be human. You still have to track people um, uh, for their hearts um, and what, what drives them emotionally. Uh, machines can do a lot of things, but there are a lot of things machines cannot do. So personal ethics always come into play because this isn't about you and it isn't even about your clients. It's really ultimately about the consumer. Um, you, if you do a really good job reaching the right the consumer for your client, that's you're doing a better job for your client than just keeping your client happy and giving them what they want to hear. Because what they need to hear is reality. What's really going on in the marketplace? What's really happening on the street? Um, and people are still going to be people. And one of my thoughts about that is, you know, we have our quirks, we have our limitations. We also have amazing potential. But in terms of multicultural research in particular, I think really, frankly, any research, people want to be known for who they are, not what they are. You might, that woman might be a, 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 a um, single mom and you might think, oh, she's a single mom. And that's the only thing you think about her. Well, she might be a quilter. She might be a reader. She might be somebody who's really good at video games with her kids. Who knows what she might be and who she is. Um, you can't make these, these, these generalizations. You have to understand people for, you know, and appreciate them for who they are, not just what they are. And one general lesson for me that I've learned in my life is it's useful to stay both confident and humble. You need to believe in yourself, but if you get overconfident, life will bring you back down to earth and you have to anticipate change, always. Oops, going back, sorry. So question and answers. Somebody want to fire off some questions at me? We do have some in the chat. I can go ahead and read for you. Could you? Um, so Jillian asks, how did you go from studying literature to getting your MBA? What changed your mind about what you wanted to do? Um, it's really funny. I think I kind of realized uh, as much as I love literature that, um, well, when I went to, got to graduate school, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't so much about the literature as about the literature about the literature. It was all about literary, literary criticism. And um, I didn't enjoy that nearly as much. I didn't enjoy people bickering among themselves about what this all means, but, but while ignoring the text. For me, I loved literature, I love stories, and I start, really try to bring those narratives into research, into my research. It's really about human stories. What is this person like? What is that person feeling? Why? Um, there was a really interesting study I saw once that, 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 that tracked um, murder rates through history and how murder rates dropped dramatically pretty much at the, at, at the, at the, with the rise of the novel. The novel was an entry into somebody's heart, into their soul, and you'd see a character and all these different characters and how they interact with all these different people. And so people started seeing that other people were different from them. Other people had things happen to them that were similar to them, or they had, you know, so, so murder rates dropped as the novel rose because the novel was narrative. So a lot of what we do is narrative writ large. It's just on, with a large sample size, but we're telling human stories. And I always felt that I became a better quantitative researcher when I became a qualitative researcher because it's really about people. So anyway, so I started in, 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 in literature. I, I, I loved the literature, but I did not love um, uh, the, the literary criticism. And I stumbled into a job opportunity in marketing research. I had no idea what it was. I had no inclination, uh, I, I, idea that I might be good at it, but I did, I was, and I loved it. It, it happened to fit into all of my weird personality quirks about, uh, you know, my brothers would paint the walls in the house and I would paint the trim. So, you know, it was all about the details and research is very detail oriented. You kind of have to be somebody who loves detail. Um, and so I just really loved it. And I fell in love with it, with it out of the blue. So it was quite an interesting transition, but somebody gave me a chance and I, I went for it and I loved it. So we have another question from William. What did you learn from your experiences in France? Would you recommend moving to Europe as a marketer? It was really interesting to me to see how people, how first of all, the advertising is very different. You know, back, I mean, they now do this now, but in America for most of my life, people would never show an armpit in, the, in, a, in a deodorant commercial. That was like, oh, it was gross. It was tacky. It was horrible. It, would, it was too obscene. They would never, never do that. And now it's like, what? You're worried about that? <clears throat> so the advertising in Europe is always much more free, much more open, much more honest. Um, and it was interesting to see how different products were presented um, and also get to see uh, how international issues. For example, you know, Gerber's baby food 
is a huge product here. And then they decided, well, just, we'll just sell this in France. Well, the word gerbe, which is G-E-R-B-E-R, -E -R, uh, it's spelled and pronounced it's spelled the same way. It means baby throw up, specifically baby throw up, not just throwing up or throw up, it's baby throw up. The, the baby gerbe, it's like a, 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 like a, a wet burp. Um, and so it's really it's like, oops. You know, so you get these name issues and, and, and product issues because a flavor profile is, doesn't fit them right. You, can, you see, walk into a store now and you can see the influence that the Hispanic market has had on American products. You see dulce de leche, you see mango flavored, you see you know, all these different flavors that you didn't see before. They were not here. Those all started because the Hispanic market was saying, we want stuff that we like too. So seeing other, another culture, seeing another world is really, really insightful and really helpful um, and really interesting. So I, I think living in, a, in any foreign country, um, spend time in Spain or Mexico or uh, Canada is not that different enough to where it be interesting to me, but um, the rest of the world is such an interesting place. So yes, I would recommend you know, getting a chance to experience the, the world uh, however you can uh, as an intern or as, as a, 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 maybe a job, a job, um, but um, yeah, it's, it's not inexpensive to live abroad um, because you know life is complicated and expensive. But um, but it's really interesting. So I, I definitely uh, learned a lot by living abroad. Beautiful. Thank you, Carlos. Our next question comes from Jillian. Do you predict or already see any long-term changes in consumers due to the pandemic? I do. I I think you know. Uh, people will rely a lot more on, on online uh, marketing, on, online uh, sales um, than they used to. But I have this, you know, one little quirky thing. I, I like decaf coffee and I like Pete's dark roast, French dark roast uh, decaf coffee. And the grocery stores often don't have it. So it's really very frustrating, but I can find it online. So there's a lot of, you know, through this pandemic, we've seen suddenly, we saw something that I'd never seen him before in my life, which was empty store shelves, um, which was really jarring, um, really weird. Thought, ah, you can't take the supply chain for granted. Um, and, and I think these were really interesting lessons for all of us. Um, but also, um, so when people don't, can't find things the normal way, they find other ways of doing things. So then, you know, I just bought it on Amazon. So, you know, now I get cases of this, my favorite coffee and I don't have to worry about it anymore. So um, yeah, so things definitely, a lot of things will change. A lot of workplace issues will change. A lot more people will be able to work from home. You might get a job, you, might, you may not want to move to Battle Creek, Michigan, but you've always thought of working at Kellogg's would be interesting. Well, you might be able to get a job where you, you, know, you go once, uh, twice a year, and then you work the best of the time from home. Um, and it doesn't really necessarily matter that much where you are. So a lot of, the, of things have changed dramatically. And so you're, in many ways, that really opens up opportunities for all of you guys. You used to think, oh yeah, I need a job in Southern California because I want to see my family, if my girlfriend, blah, 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 whatever. That won't be the case anymore. You'll be able to look anywhere and everywhere. If you are you know, digitally competent, which I assume you are, um, you, know, you can work anywhere. And you might be, have to visit the office, you might have to go for an interview uh, you know, when we were able to travel. Uh, and there may still be some need to connect in person from time to time, but things will be different. Not every company will allow that. Not every country company will, will, will appreciate that fully, but it really opens things up for you guys enormously. So people say COVID is a future accelerator and I really do believe it is. And I think a lot of things are not gonna go back. And Jillian also asks, what are your hopes for the next generation of researchers? Ah, what are my hopes? Obviously, coming, going, going into your, your careers prepared with the basic information, knowing statistics, knowing the basic rules of sampling, know the basic rules of, of marketing research, that's great. That's all really important, really useful. Um, but um, I would just hope that people don't rely entirely on, on technology, but that they use the technology to try to understand, and, and, but keep, for humanistic purposes, um, that you guys keep a, keep a handle on the heart issues, and uh, the heart and soul uh, to try to understand people. Um, but I think you, this, the future is yours. It really is, especially with more technology, especially with all these way things are, are going these days. Um, you guys have an in. You have so much power. 
and more power than I, my generation did when we came into, into the industry. Um, because you have the digital native skills and these are huge, huge. And you know, you're in, you're, you're, you know your generation. You know your culture, you know your generation, you know your, your, your friends and colleagues and families uh, in ways that other people don't. And um, especially if you're multicultural, uh, that's a, a big advantage, uh, a big, big, big advantage. Um, and it doesn't mean that you know, everything will be easy or that things will be simple, um, but it does mean that you have a leg up. So you have, you, know, you have your generational advantage, you have your digital advantage, and you have a multicultural advantage. And, um, and so these are things that are really uh, cool and important for you. And again, it isn't necessarily that you happen to be from that, that, uh, that specific ethnology, uh, ethnicity or race, it's that you are fam your familiarity with them, the fact that you grew up with them, that you went to college with them, that you, you, you know, they're all been around you your whole life. Um, this is an advantage. So you guys come in with more power and don't have to flaunt it, but don't have to be afraid of it either. Um, but you also have to remember that the generations that are coming behind you will have new advantages on you. And you have to always stay in, in tune with them as you go grow in your career. You have to take, take extra effort to, to be respectful of them, to understand their world and better, to better understand their world. The next question comes from Andrea. Um, what are some skills that can help students prepare for multicultural research? Um, obviously language. Um, if you have language, if you come from a, a multicultural, multilingual household, um, focus on that. I mean, even if you have never been able to study, you know, Korean or Chinese or, or Spanish or, or, or Armenian or Russian or whatever family your background is, um, don't, admit, don't ignore that. Go in and study it. Make a point of it. If you don't, can't take classes on that or it's too late to take classes, go, you know, go to the community college to take classes. Um, do or buy uh, online systems to learn, you know, Babel and all these other systems to, to learn languages. So languages are really important. Um, writing, you know, I, I really harassed all of my students about this. Writing is incredibly important. Practice writing, take writing classes. You, there are online classes. We don't have to go physically attend or get credits or, have to, you know, all that stuff. Writing is so important for your career because you see, you see it in your emails, you see it in even your texts. Um, writing is important. You have to know the difference between two, two, and two, and there, there, and there. You just, you just have to know these things. You have to think about it. You have to know them. And, and, and you know, it you know, doesn't mean you won't make typos in your life, but you also have to proof things before sending. Don't hit send. Write something. Reread it. Read it out loud. You'll catch weirdo errors that you made, or you 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 use the same word twice in the same sentence. It's like, ooh, ah, ooh. Uh, check your work, um, and it's, it's something that I started doing. And I, I would now, what I do now is I have a couple of people of proofers that in my company, and I send them my materials. That I that I I'd say I'm saying the your dear client, and 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 here's a, my whole proposal, or here's my whole message about an issue or something we're discussing, or. Uh, or, or, or whatever, um, and I send it internally to my proofers to, and they catch things. I think, oh, this is fine, I've reread it, it's fine. You know, having your colleagues proof things can be really helpful. I said, well, this is good, but it kind of raises another issue. Do you really want to raise that issue? You know, oh, I didn't, ooh, then you change it. So, you know, check your work, proof your work, proof each other's work with a good catch kind of approach, not a, ah, you look at this, you made a mistake. It's not that kind of thing. You want to help your colleagues, your colleague, you want your colleagues to help you. So sharing, sharing things before you hit send can really be helpful. It might take, sometimes you don't have time and you just have to do something quickly and you do it. But if you have time, if you can, share things, proof things and work on your writing. Read more. I always recommend that you people read the New Yorker and the New York Times. You can get the New Yorker and the New York Times on your phone, it's easy. Um, and just, just you see high level of, of diction, high level of vocabulary, really, really good writing, really clear writing. Um, and so, you know, if you're not exposed to good writing, it's hard to emulate it. So, um, so just reading your friends' texts and, you know, articles you, you know, see on BuzzFeed, that's not going to do it. Um, you really need to raise your game, especially if you want a high level career. 
you have to be able to communicate effectively. And a lot of that is writing. So don't ignore writing. I'm not talking cursive. I'm talking about, you know, computer laptops, your, your keyboards, but writing. The next question is from Patrick. Um, do you think that market research will adapt to be more interactive or interesting to capture the attention of an increasingly distracted world? If so, in what way? They are doing that now. A lot of this stuff is going on. There's a company called M4 that's all smartphone based and they do a lot of geofencing and, and uh, experiential and in the moment kind of research. Like, like the questionnaire, you know, like the, the survey that I sent when I walked into the shoe department of, of Target. Um, uh, and that kind of research is really very of the moment of, you know, uh, this is what's happening. You happen to be in the, the canned soup section or you know, whatever uh, aisle and they, they can even tell where, where you are. That's, that's, there's a lot of work that the industry needs to do to geofence more carefully, um, but they're starting to do that. And um, so, uh, uh, yeah, the industry is changing. Um, and, and, you know, the companies like M4, they're not the only smartphone based researcher uh, out there, but they're, they're, you know, they're the, one of the more prominent, at least the one that I know the best. Um, I've been to their offices in, uh, in Irvine. Um, and one of the things that struck me about going into their office is that they looked like our world. There were Latinos and Asians and, 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 and young women and older people. And there were all, there was a really, a really interesting mix, racial and, and, and demographic mix um, in their in their workforce, uh, which I thought was really smart. Um, but anyway, so yeah, the in, of the moment stuff. Uh, people are doing ethnographies, um, you know, qualitative ethnographies on people's phones. Take a picture of this. Take a picture of that. Um, it was really interesting. At one point, I did an ethnography like that of people uh, for um, I think it was for General Mills, and it was all about frozen foods or using frozen foods or using kind of product that they were making. Um, and they were looking at uh, Latinos and how they prepared things and how they took their, their, their prepared foods and how, how they used them. And um, so the, the, the people who did the study, didn't, I wasn't really directly involved, but they asked me to help in the, in the presentation. So they sent me the data and they sent me, oh, they showed, they sent me the, the, the photos that they were using uh, that came off people's phones and took pictures of their, of their process and how they're boiling the, the, the pasta and putting it into, you know, adding the cheese or whatever they're making. Um, and um, it was all very interesting to see the videos and, 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 the, and the stills. Um, but then I, you know, I was noticing other things. And so when we did the presentation, I was doing a color commentary uh, all the way through it. So, and also giving context and background to the data so that people would understand what the numbers meant and what the, what the, even what the images meant. Um, for example, like, like Latinos were taking the standardized American processed foods and Hispanicizing them. They were adding chiles, they were adding, you know, peppers and, and, uh, uh, and salsa and, and, and uh, avocados. And they were, they were just making it more food, that, food they're familiar with. So it was all of those modifications that really was really interesting to the client. And then the client said, okay, well, we don't want the report but with all of Carlos's color commentary. Because really that color commentary really helped explain everything. So you have to know, you know knowing the community, consumer and being able to interpret what you're saying you know, it, it helps to be hip to what's going on. So yeah, things are changing, things are changing really quickly, but people are still people uh, and you have to always bring that, that emotional history and context, cultural context and um, to, to every study. Okay, it looks like there's two more questions. So um, the next is from Dr. Zhang. What is one thing you are most proud of doing and one thing you wish to do all over again as a professional? Mm. What I'm most proud of doing. Um, I think I'm, I can help contribute to the knowledge panel. Uh, they developed what they call the knowledge panel Latino, which was like a subset of the knowledge panel. And it was a perfectly rep sample of the Latino population in the United States. And being involved in that and contributing to that was really interesting. Um, I was also involved in the very first study that, has, that Nielsen did with uh, Latinos uh, and trying to build a Hispanic people meter um, database um, and doing the sampling for that. And that was really an interesting study because it was really the first time big corporate America was getting involved in our little old, little old Hispanic market stuff. And it was really, really fascinating to be uh, in that. Um, and things in terms of I wish I had done better, 
Um, I wish I had, had been less, I, I made a classic error, in, you know, business error of being too reliant on one particular client. And when that client had issues, um, a lot of our business went away. And I, I'd really been socked, myself, socked into a situation where I had uh, firm overhead. Uh, it wasn't fungible. It wasn't, you know, uh, um, um, something I could easily dis 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 discard. So, um, so I was stuck in, a, in an overhead situation. I, I lost my flexibility, um, and that was a really big, bad business decision. Uh, and I thought everything was fine, but then the, you know the recession hit, and then I thought, well, we'll be, we'll be okay through 2008. Yeah, we were, and then 2009, we'll be okay. We were, and then 10 happened. Uh, 10, 2010 the recession still didn't go away. Uh, and then even into 2011, the recession didn't go away. So, um, so you know, you kind of have to imagine, be prepared for every kind of eventuality. And I wasn't. Uh, and those were areas where I wish I had been more uh, alert to possible problems. Um, and how America, you know, America got blindsided by, by COVID, worst of any country in the world. Uh, and, you know, should we have learned, learned lessons from that? Yeah, you think half a million, you know, half a million people later, you think we should have learned some business, some some lessons from that. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a lot of things I wish I'd done better and differently, uh, but especially for in terms of preparation, being expect expecting, anticipating change, be prepared for disasters, sort of like earthquake proofing your house. It, the, the big earthquake might not hit for 20,000 years, but it might be tomorrow. You never know. So, um, you know, so you have to kind of be prepared for different eventualities. You might think everything is great and everything's moving forward and then you lose your job. Ah, now what do I do? So you have, you know, you have to be prepared. You have to have a, a, a nest egg. You have to have, you know, uh, other, other avenues, other connections. Uh, you can't assume that everything is perfect and will stay that way forever because it won't. Um, no matter how good things are, no matter how bad things are, it won't stay the same. So even when things are down, you'll come back You'll be fine. You'll get over it. And the same as with the things are perfect. It might not stay perfect. It might, hopefully, but you can't count on it. So be prepared. And the last question in chat is from Sebastian. How do you think the integration of qualitative and quantitative data is changing the industry landscape? It's, it's, it's part of the speeding up things of things. Uh, so people can get studies done more quickly. They used to do a quali you know, qualitative exploratory study and then you know, to understand what questions to ask. Uh, and then they would ask the questions, then they would do a, you know, focus groups afterwards to understand them. Nobody has that time anymore. Um, people do not have that time anymore. So um, um, it's basically part of, of, of uh, the speeding up of these things. Um, and you can see in real time why it's important for clients to be able to turn studies around really quickly because the circumstances change, realities change, people change, um, and you have to be ready to go. So integrating qual and quant is really an interesting thing, um, especially as AI is helping facilitate that. So um, uh, if people give their permission to be, in, be, to be interviewed live on, uh, on, a, uh, in, on a qualitative, in, in, on a online, what am I saying, thinking of, of an open-ended question, for example, uh, and then they might be follow-on questions. There are AIs that do full-on focus groups. Uh, there are AIs that do open ends and then ask probing questions. So a lot of those things can, and it learns as it goes along to, which, you know, to, to ask better and better questions. So these are things that are now available um, and are pretty amazing. Um, and they really help the researcher look with a humanistic eye, hopefully, on, on, on what the, the data means. Um, so, so again, this is thing, some things won't change. What's changing is, is using technology to get to answers faster. It's and, and, and maybe better, but, um, but the key thing is to always bring your, your own heart, your own experiences, uh, your own understanding of people um, and to look at these things in a different way than the machine can. Okay, uh, uh, thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, thanks for sharing your wisdom and uh, um, your experience uh, with us. It was very informative and I enjoyed every second of it. <laughs> uh, and also thank you everyone, uh, the audience for uh, joining us.
for this event. And um, uh, we are going to have uh, uh, similar events regularly. Uh, so we hope to see you in the future. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of the day and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, guys. Believe in yourselves. You guys are powerful. You have power. Use it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.